Okay, well, moving on to lesson 6.2, using resources wisely. The goal for this lesson is to evaluate the cost and benefits of renewable and non-renewable resources such as water, energy, fossil fuels, wildlife, and forest. So why did the chicken cross the road? Hmm. Did I show that one to you guys yet? I don't remember. Okay, our objectives. Let's describe how human activities affect soil and land, describe how human activities affect water resources, and describe how human effect activities affect air resources. One at a time. So let's think about it. The goods and services provided by healthy ecosystems are essential to life. If we don't properly manage agriculture, we may one day lose the natural resources on which it depends. How do we obtain what we need from local and global environments without destroying those environments is the big question of life. All right, objective one. Describe how human activities affect soil and land. The mineral and nutrient-rich portion of soil is called the topsoil. Da, da, da. Good topsoil absorb, absorbs and retains moisture, yet allows water to drain. It is rich in organic matter and nutrients, but low in salts. Good topsoil is produced by long-term interactions between soil and the plants growing in it. Topsoil can be a renewable resource if it is managed properly, but it, it can be damaged or lost if it is mismanaged. Here's an example of some mismanagement. After years of poorly managed farming, in addition to severe drought in the 1930s, badly eroded the once fertile soil of the Great Plains. The area essentially turned to desert, or what called a dust bowl is what they called it. The Dust Bowl of the 1930s was caused, in part, by conversion of the prairie land to cropland in ways that left soil vulnerable to erosion. Soil erosion is the removal of soil by wind or water. Soil erosion is often worse when land is plowed and then left barren between plantings. When no roots are left to hold soil in place, it can be easily washed or blown away. When soil is badly eroded, organic matter and minerals that make it fertile are often then carried away with the soil, making it useless to grow things in. In parts of the world with dry climates, a combination of farming, overgrazing of animals, seasonal droughts, and climate change can turn farmland into desert. This process is called desertification. Roughly 40% of Earth's land is considered at risk for desert desertification. This map shows vulnerable areas in North and South America. So this is over the South America region, I just realized. Moving on. We've got some serious stuff in North America going on too. Deforestation, or the loss of trees, can have a negative effect on soil quality also. More than half of the world's old growth forests, forests that have never been cut, have been lost to deforestation. Healthy forests hold soil in place, protect the quality of freshwater supplies, absorb carbon dioxide, and help moderate local climate. Some areas, forests can regrow after cutting, but it takes centuries for a succession to produce mature old for growth forest. In some places, forests don't grow back at all after logging. This is why old growth forests are usually considered non-renewable resources. Deforestation, as you can see from the picture, can lead to severe erosion. Grazing or plowing after deforestation can permanently change local soils and the microclimates in ways that prevent regrowth of trees. For example, when a tropical rainforest is cleared for timber or agriculture, their soil is typically used for just a few years. And after that, the area becomes a wasteland. The thin topsoil and high heat and humidity prevent it from being regrowth. Leaving stems and roots, roots of the previous year's crops in the soil can help hold soil in place between plantings. Crop rotation, planting different crops at different seasons or in different years, can help prevent both erosion and nutrient loss. The practice of contour plowing involves planting fields of crops across instead of down the slope of the land here. 
They use the slope of the land to help shape their um, farm. This can reduce water runoff and therefore erosion. Terracing, shaping the land to create leveled steps, also helps hold water and soil. If you've ever been on a plane, you're flying or up to Indiana or something, you can see a lot of this happening already in America. It's really quite pretty, too. Selective har harvesting mature trees can promote the growth of younger trees and preserve the forest ecosystem, including its soil. A well-managed tree farm both protects the soil and makes the trees themselves a renewable resource. But we have to be careful. So objective one, describe how humans affects soil and land. Healthy soil supports, as we know, both agriculture and foresty, forestry. And it is possible, with being careful, to minimize soil erosion through careful management of both agricultural and forestry too. Objective two is to describe how human activities affect water resources. All right, humans depend, obviously, on freshwater and freshwater ecosystems for goods and services, including drinking water, industry, transportation, energy, and waste disposal. Some farmland relies heavily on irrigation, in which freshwater is brought in from other resources. Some sources of freshwater are not renewable. The Agala Aquifer, for example, right here is where it's located, spans eight states from South Dakota to Texas. The aquifer took more than a million years to collect and is not replenished by rainfall today. So much water is being pumped out of the Ogallala <laughs> that is expected to run dry in ugh, 20 to 40 years. And you should know only 3% of Earth's water is fresh water and most of that is locked up in ice at the poles too. So freshwater resources can be affected by different kinds of pollution. Of course, a pollutant is a harmful material that can enter the biosphere. Pollutants that enter water supplies from a single source, like a factory and oil spill, for example, can point, can, are called point source pollutions. Pollutants that enter water supplies from many smaller sources, like grease and oil washed off the streets by rain or the chemicals released into the air by factories and automobiles, are called non-point source pollution. Make sure you understand the difference between those two. Pollutants may enter both surface water and underground water supplies that we can access with wells. The primary sources of water pollutants are industrial and agricultural chemicals, residential sewage, and other non-point resources. One, in the, one industrial, this is an example, pollutant is, a, is a, in a class of organic chemicals called PCBs, and they were widely used in industry until 1970s. After several large contamination events, then PCBs were banned. Because PCBs often enter mud and sand beneath bodies of water, they can be difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate. Other harmful industrial pollutants are heavy metals like cadmium, lead, mercury, and zinc. Large-scale monoculture has increased the use of pesticides and insecticides. These chemicals can enter the water supply in the form of runoff after heavy rains, or they can seep directly into the groundwater. Pesticides can be very dangerous pollutants. DDT effectively controls agricultural pest and disease-causing mosquitoes. But some pesticides, such as the insecticide DDT, are potential pollutants. And when DDT gets into water supply, a phenomenon known as biological magnification can occur. Biological magnification occurs if a pollutant, such as like DDT, mercury, or PCB, is picked up by an organism and is not broken down or eliminated from its body. Instead, the pollutant collects in the body tissues. Now, we, we learned about biological mag magnification in Chapter 3 when we played our game, too. In the process of biological magnification, so let's review, primary producers can pick up a pollutant from the environment, herbivores eat those producers, concentrate, and store the compound, pollutant concentrations in herbivores may be more than 10 times the levels in the producers. When carnivores then eat the herbivores, the compound is still further concentrated. In the highest trophic levels, Pollutant concentrations may reach 10 million times their original concentration in the environment. 
These high concentrations can cause serious problems for wildlife and humans. Widespread DDT used in the 1950s threatened fish-eating birds like pelicans, osprey, falcons, and bald eagles. It caused females to lay eggs with thin, fragile shells, reducing hatching rates and causing a drop in bird birth populations. Since DDT was banned in the 1970s, bird populations are now recovering. Still a concern is mercury, which accumulates in the bodies of certain marine fish such as tuna and swordfish too. Quick little side story, when I was a little girl, DDT was commonly used on military bases to kill uh, mosquitoes, and a big truck would go up and down the street spraying this stuff. All the kids would be outside, and we'd just go run behind the truck and play in the DDT. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> we didn't know better, nor did our parents. One key to sustainable water is used is to protect the natural systems involved in the water cycle. Protecting these ecosystems is a critical part of watershed conservation. A watershed includes all the land whose groundwater, streams, and rivers drain into the same place, such as a large lake or river. Pollution control can have direct and positive effects on the water quality in a watershed. Sewage treatment can lower levels of sewage-associated bacteria and help prevent dead zones and bodies of water receiving the runoff. Agriculture can use integrated pest management instead of pesticides. IPM is integrated pest management techniques include using predators and parasites to regulate for pests using less poisonous sprays and crop rotation. Conserving water is also important. One example of water conservation in agriculture is drip irrigation, which we also have in our garden too, which delivers water drop by drop directly to the roots of the plants. Tiny holes in water hoses allow farmers to deliver water where it's needed. So, objective two is describe how human activities affect the water resources. Oh my gosh, we make a mess of everything, don't we? Primary sources of water pollution are industrial and agricultural chemicals, residential, sewage, and non-point sources. Objective three, describe how human activities affect air resources. All right. The atmosphere which provides the oxygen we breathe is a common resource whose quality has direct effect on our, on our health. Ozone, a form of oxygen that is found naturally in the upper, upper atmosphere, absorbs harmful ultraviolet radiation from sunlight before it reaches Earth's surface. Us. The ozone layer protects our skin in, from damage that can cause cancer. The atmosphere's greenhouse gas includes carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor regulates the global temperature. Without the greenhouse effect, Earth's average temperature would be about 30 degrees Celsius cooler than it is today. That is quite a bit, so we need some greenhouse gases. When the quality of Earth's atmosphere is reduced, respiratory illnesses such as asthma are made worse and skin diseases tend to increase. Globally, climate patterns may be affected. Industrial processes and the burning of fossil fuels can release pollutants of several kinds. Common forms of air pollution include smog, acid, acid rain, greenhouse gases, and particulates. Smog is a gray-brown haze formed by chemical reactions among pollutants released into the air by industrial processes and automobile exhaust. Ozone is one product of these reactions. At ground level, ozone and other pollutants threaten the health of people, especially those with respiratory conditions. Many athletes participating in the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, China, expressed concern over how intense the smog would affect their performance and health. How the intense smog, I should say. All right. Burning fossil fuels releases nitrogen and sulfur compounds. When these compounds combine with water vapor in the air, they form nitric and sulfuric acids. These airborne acids can drift for many kilometers before they fall as acid rain. Acid precipitation can dissolve and release mercury and other toxic elements from the soil, freeing those elements to enter other parts of the biosphere. In some areas, acid rain kills plants by damaging their leaves and changing the chemistry of soils and surface water. Acid rain can cause damage to also stone statues wears them down drastically. Burning fossil fuels on forests 
re burning fossil fuels in forest, excuse me, releases stored carbon into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. Agricultural practices release methane, cows, other greenhouse gas. Although some greenhouse gases are necessary, when it gets extreme, excess greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere and they contribute to the global warming and the climate change. Before I mention particulates, so what are particulates? Particulates are microscopic particles of ash and dust released by certain industrial processes and certain kinds of diesel en engines. Very small particulates can pass to the nose and mouth and then enter your lungs. You can see the size of a particulate All right, in comparison to other things here. Um, when they pass through your nose and mouth and enter the lungs, they can cause some serious health problems for you. Automobile emission standards and clean air regulations seem to have, be having a net positive effect. This is good news. The graph on this slide summarizes the EPA findings of the total percentage change from 1980 to 2007 in vehicle miles traveled, energy consumption, and the combined emissions of six common pollutants. So if we're still traveling quite a bit, energy consumption has pretty much remained the same, but the six common pollutants has drastically decreased, as you can see from this graph. So at one time, for example, all gasoline was enriched with lead, and U.S. efforts to phase out leaded gasoline were completed in 1996 with the sale of leaded gasoline was banned. Now that unleaded gasoline is widely used across the United States, Lead levels in soils, rivers, and streams around the country have dropped significantly from early higher levels. That's good news. Some positive there. So objective three was to describe how human activities affect air resources. Common forms of air pollution include smog, acid rain, greenhouse gases, and particulates. So finally, can you describe how human activities affect soil and land? Describe how human activities affect water resources, and finally describe how human activities affect air resources. Here's something freaky for you to stare at, something different. Is it moving? It's moving for me. All right, adios.